dreams, all life's joys you've given me when troubles come. You're always there to make me smile. Let come what may, I will be done. I love you, Jesus, God's precious Son. Lord, you're the best thing that ever happened to me. Prevailed, you pick me up, plant my feet on solid ground. Why you would love me, I sure don't know, but I'll keep on singing as I go. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me, and I owe it all to you, Lord. All I have is yours. Make it what you'd have me be. Cause I'm your child and you're my father. I'm the clay and you're the potter. Lord, you're the best thing ever happened to me. Cause I'm your child and you're my father. I'm the clay and you're the potter. Lord, you're the best thing ever happened to me. Amen. Amen. Well, glory to God. Amen. Amen. Make sure we got sound this morning. Are we on here? Lapel mic on? All right. Well, good. It's good to be in God's house this morning. I mean, a little warm in here, but we'll get through it. Amen. <laughs> Start to get a little warm, but if y'all all right, we'll be good. Everybody all right this morning? All right. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Proverbs 28th chapter. Proverbs 28th chapter, one verse, verse 13, and we're going to read that, and, and uh, then we're going to talk just a minute. We'll get into this message. But uh, <clears throat> that last verse of that song we just sang, Proverbs 28, verse 13. The last verse of that song we just sang, it says, For every time that I have fell, each time I've stumbled and sin prevailed, you pick me up and plant my feet on solid ground. I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me. Amen? I I would propose that you probably have had the same experience. As any Christian does, as we as we try to serve God, we find very quickly that we can't do it. We find out very quickly that we still have flesh that that gets in the way of our service of God. We have we have a flesh that seems to have a mind of its own. You know, the Bible tells us that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. We're 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 to love Him completely. We're to yield to Him completely. We're to yearn for Him completely. We're to follow Him completely. We're to walk completely in His strength and not our own. We're to forsake our own understanding and and lean unto His wisdom. <clears throat> but the truth of it is, we foul that up often. We foul that up and foul that up and foul that up. And, and it gets to a point where sometimes people just say, you know what, I can't do this and I just give up. I've seen so many people along the way of serving God absolutely give up. And I can guarantee you, if you sat and thought about it, you could probably name on at least one hand five people that you know that have given up and have, have dropped out, who's, who seemingly were serving God, and you thought, hey, they're going to, you know, this is a believer. This is somebody going to serve God and do right. And then you see them fall away. You see them fall down. Maybe they get up, maybe they don't. But the fact of it is, 
That's going to happen to everybody at some point in time. They're going to get discouraged and they're going to fall down. What happens at that point is what makes all the difference. The falling down, I mean, the Bible says a righteous man falleth seven times yet riseth up again. It's not the fact that you fall. It's not how hard you fell. It's what you do once you fail. Amen? And we're going to look at some people who fell down this morning, but I want to give you, I want to give you a title of this message. It's very simple. It's you can start over. You can start over. That's the most encouraging thing I can give you this morning. And I don't know that anybody in here this, this morning is at that point. I don't know that anybody in here this morning is struggling. But evidently somebody's struggling somewhere because the Lord laid it on my heart to preach this this morning. So I want, I want you to know this morning, if you're struggling with some area of your life, if you're feeling like, man, I've just really blown it, I want you to know something. God is in the second chance business. God's in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. He's, on, he's in the chance giving business. As long as you still are here, as long as you still have breath in your lungs, as long as blood's still pumping through your body and you have consciousness, God is not finished. Amen? So Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, we're going to read that one verse. We're going to pray and we're going to get into the message. Good morning, Miss Taylor. Good to see you this morning. Proverbs 28 and verse 13, the Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, I just love you, and I thank you this morning, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the privilege and the honor to be able to preach your word. Father, I'm thankful for these that are here this morning. Lord, we'd like to have a house full, but Lord, we realize that folks are out, and Lord, we realize that, that a lot of folks don't want the truth. Lord, well, I just pray this morning, Lord, that you would bless the ones that are here this morning, Lord, scattered though we may be. Lord, there's some who are out of church this morning. Father, we pray for them, Lord, that you'd get them back to us. Uh, quickly and safely. And Father, I just pray for the ones that are listening in on the internet this morning. Father, I pray you'd touch them. Father, speak to them in a real way. Lord, I pray, Father, that they would be encouraged to get up from their despair. Lord, to get up from their depression. Lord, to get up from their discouragement and begin to serve you again, Father. I pray the Holy Ghost of God bring conviction on the lives of those, Lord, who've gotten discouraged and have decided maybe it's not worth it to keep walking and trying to serve the Lord. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you please would refresh them this morning, and Lord, give them the grace and the mercy to be able to stand up for you once again and walk and serve you and please you and, and walk in your in, in your presence, Lord, and you walk in your word, the light of your word and give you their all. Father, we thank you. For all the gospel preachers around the world that are lifting up the Word of God this morning, lifting up Jesus. And I pray, Lord, you'd give them Holy Ghost power and unction as you, I ask you to give me this morning. Father, please bless us and meet with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to be too long this morning. I'm going to try my best not to. But I, let's look at that verse again. The Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. I can think of somebody, when I think of covering sin... There's one person in my mind that always jumps out to me. Can anybody guess who that might be? Anybody? Covering sin. Huh? Well, that's a good one. But the one that always gets me is Achan. Achan, you remember what they did? They took spoils. He took spoils. They were told not to take any spoils of war in that particular battle. But yet Achan took, he took some, what was it, silver or gold? I can't remember now, all of a sudden it escaped me. But he, I want to say it was gold, and he took, he took some wedges of gold, and he took some, some raiment, some changes of clothes, and he buried them in the floor of his tent. He had been, God had told them, don't take nothing. Kill everything and don't leave any, and leave it all. Don't take nothing. Now God had something better for them than those spoils, you realize. God had something much greater. He would have told them, take everything you can find. But because God had something better, man's eye, Achan's eyes couldn't see that. Achan's eyes, he was, not, he was walking by sight and not by faith at that time. Or otherwise, Achan would have realized, hey, God is in this. God has given us this victory, and God's told us a command, and I need to follow God no matter what. But instead, what did he do? He took that, and he knew he had done wrong. That's why he hid it in the, in the floor of his, of his tent. That's why he covered it up and hid it. And it cost them a great, uh, it cost them a victory in the next battle that they fought. And it cost Achan and his family their life. 
And see, the Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. There's no good going to come out of trying to cover your sins. That's just very simple. Listen, Adam and Eve tried to cover their sins too. God, God got them figured out pretty quick. Amen. There's been a plenty who've tried to cover and hide what they've done. But God always exposes the sin because there's nothing hidden from the Lord. Amen. There's nowhere you can go. There's nothing you can do to hide from God. His eyes are everywhere. He sees it all, all the time. The Bible tells us if you cover them, you, you won't prosper. There's nothing good going to come of it. He said, but whoso confesseth, whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Now, Sometimes we're pretty good at confessing. We say, Lord, I blew it. I, I, I messed up. I, I flubbed up this time, Lord God. I, 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 I didn't follow you, and, I, and I'm sorry. But the problem is we don't do the second part. The Bible says, Whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. It's not enough to say, God, I'm sorry I did that. You know, I, I can tell you right now, if I do something, if I do something today, to hurt my wife's feelings, and I tell her I'm sorry, and before the sun goes down, I do it again, do you think she's going to accept that first apology? She's not going to think I was very sincere, is she? Right. And then if I get up the next morning and do it again, and, and before dinner do it again, I, I'm not very sorry, am I? See, we're good at telling God we're sorry, but are we good at, at leaving it behind? That's the problem, Amen. <clears throat> But but God says when we do that, we're going to have mercy. I'm thankful to know that God is not God is not a God who holds something over my head and never lets me forget it. Amen. Speaking of wives, praise God. Amen. No, I'm just joking. But anyway, <coughs> but God's not like that. God God won't hold it over our heads. Forgive. God's a forgiving God. Amen. I want to take a look at, at a few people in the Bible who were in a similar situation. What we're talking about this morning. Take your Bible and turn over to the book of Jonah. Amen? The book of Jonah. And uh, that's to the left of the Psalms, if you don't know exactly where Jonah is. It's over in the crispy pages. Oftentimes we call them that. Jonah, and we're going to look in there in chapter 2. Chapter 2, we're going to actually look at that whole chapter there. Chapter 2 is only 10 verses. But we know the story, don't we? God told Jonah to go to Tarshish. I'm sorry, not to Tarshish. He told Jonah, what? Oh, I'm sorry, it's to the right, wasn't it? I mean, I, I guess I was there looking at it wrong. But anyway, it's to the right, amen? I got y'all back over in the mother books. But God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, not to Tarshish. He told him to go to Nineveh and to preach to those people down there in Nineveh. That was, Nineveh was Nineveh had had about a hundred and twenty thousand people down there that were just as just as 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 far from God as could be. They turned they were they were a heathen nation, and God sent God sent Jonah down there. And rather than destroy the city of Nineveh, God is a merciful God, and He said, you know, I want to send you down there to preach and tell them to repent. And what did Jonah? And Jonah, listen, Jonah was a preacher. Jonah was a man of God. Jonah was a preacher of of, of God, and he and and God God had called him evidently. God had fitted him. God had equipped him. And, and I, the Bible doesn't tell us where he'd been preaching before, but we know he was a preacher. And God sent him to go and to preach to those people, and he just flat didn't want to go. He just did not want to go. And I, I can tell you, I, I, it really had to do with the fact that I, I don't think Jonah thought them people was going to listen to him to begin with. Because Jonah was looking at things from his earthly perspective. Jonah, Jonah was looking at things from his own mind. The Bible tells us to, 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 to trust the Lord with all our heart. Lean not to our own understanding. It's not up to us to decide who's, who's, who should get saved and who should not get saved. Amen? It's up to the Lord. The Lord is in, in the saving business, not us. But he told him to go down there, and we'll look at verse <coughs> chapter 2 and verse 1. So he got on that boat, and he's on his way to Tarshish, and you know you know the story, the great storm come up, and, and those people all thought they were going to die. And, and Jonah, you know, Jonah offered himself up and said, throw me into the sea, it's me, it's, it's me, I know it's me, God's after me. And and they threw him overboard. And the Bible said there in verse 17, the last, uh, the last of the first chapter, says that the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And, of course, we know that's, a, that's symbolic of what the Lord Jesus Christ, he was in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. 
But I want you to look here in verse two, chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. <laughs> you hear that description he gave? Out of the belly of hell. I cannot imagine. I mean, we've read this story ever since we've been in Sunday school. But I, I was sitting there thinking about it yesterday. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be inside of a whale's stomach? Can you imagine the, the absolute horror that he experienced? He thought, I'm going to jump in, I'm going to drown, I'll be dead. And, and, you know, I mean, he was evidently a believer. He, he, he thought, well, I'll drive, you know, God, at least I'll be with the Lord when I die. So he's, he's jumped in. And I figure he thinks he's going to drown. God's destroying him. This is the end. That's why the storm came. And then that fish swallows him. I mean, I, he was at the bottom evidently from the way he's talking, and we're going to read that in just a second, but that fish swallowed him up. He said, For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. But he said it was the belly of hell. I can't imagine. I mean, to think, this is the, I thought I was going to drown, but now I'm going to be digested. I mean, what a horrible, horrible, horrible way to think you're going to die. You know, and he still has consciousness while he's in there. He realizes the situation he's in. He said, For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet, I will look again toward thy holy temple. Something's happening to Jonah down on the bottom. Jonah's beginning to realize the mess he got himself into. Jonah's beginning to realize this is all my fault. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul, the depths closed around round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee. In thine holy temple, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee from the, with the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. What happened in the bottom of the, of, of the fish's belly? I can tell you what happened in the fish's belly. Jonah said, Lord, I was wrong. I was so wrong, Lord, and I repent. I, I, I want to be forgiven. I've done wrong, Lord. I mean, hey, he wasn't doing that on the ship in the storm. He wasn't doing that when everybody's begging him, you know, what, what's wrong here? What's wrong? Why, why is God mad? I mean, they were I'm sure they were all over him about it. What's going on? Why is the ship doing it? Why is the storm? Are your God's mad at you? What's the deal here? He hadn't yet felt any remorse. But when he finally got down to the very bottom, and a lot of times it takes us getting to the very bottom before we realize how bad we failed God. In the very worst possible situation that I think anybody could probably find themselves into next. I mean, he was next to death's door. And here in the very, very, very furthest he could possibly ever go. You talk about somebody going as far as somebody could possibly go away from God. He's at the bottom of the sea in a whale's belly. He said, salvation is of the Lord. You know what? If I'm going to live, it's God. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And you know what I find fascinating? I find fascinating the next words that are spoken. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. I can't imagine what Jonah looked like when he come up out of that whale's belly. But I can tell you this, he was he was probably about white as James's shirt. Uh, all them stomach acids been working over him. He was probably bleached out and sickly looking, probably stunk to high heaven. But you know what? None of that mattered. All that mattered was what God had told him because you know what? He came to the realization, he came to the end of himself in that whale's stomach. He got he came to the realization that his way was wrong. That God's way's right, and God's way's always right. And what God said in the beginning was what he ought to have been doing to start with. He realized that. 
repentance that took place in the bottom of the sea. He said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went into, unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. He did it right that time. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And he went and he preached. Amen? He didn't have to say a whole lot either. He didn't say much at all. Amen? He said, yet 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. That was all he had to do. You see that? That's all God, God told him. Just go in there and preach and tell them, I'm going to destroy you if you don't repent. What a hard message it was. But you see, man's stubbornness got in the way of God's will. And when man's stubbornness gets in the way of God's will, God has to bring judgment to bring man back to where he wants him to be. Amen? God has a plan for my life. God has a plan for your life. And God's plan's right. Our plan's wrong. It's as simple as that. Unless our plan is in line with God's plan, our plan's wrong. All he had to do was obey God and look at all the trouble he brought upon himself. And yet God, and yet God in his mercy, was willing to take a man from as close to death as a man could possibly be and bring him out and give him another chance. And what happened? Jonah 3.10 says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them, and he did it not. I think that's amazing. Amen? Well, Listen, all he uttered was, how many words was it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven words, he said. And God moved in power upon that whole city, and that whole city turned to God. It's amazing what happens if someone would just follow God's will. Amen? Listen, you can always start over as long as there's still time, as long as there's still breath in your lungs, as long as you still got a heart beating, there's still time to turn it over to God and do right. I want you to look at a second thing. Turn to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. We're going to look at old Moses for a minute. Exodus chapter 2. We Most of us, I guess most all of us know the story of Moses. We ought to anyway, if we've been in Sunday school. But Moses, God granted Moses a second start. God gave him a second chance to try to deliver Israel. You say, I don't, I don't, I don't know if y'all remember, but <clears throat> he tried to do it his way the first time. In Exodus chapter 2, beginning verse 11, the Bible says, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. You see, this is that's the beginning of, we, of, of us hearing of Moses beginning to feel differently. He grew up in Pharaoh's house. He grew up as the daughter, of, uh, uh, as the as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You know, she drew him out of the water. That's why she called him Moses. And he grew up in Pharaoh's house, and he wanted for nothing. He was he was there at the at the at at the throne of the, of the most powerful man in the entire known world at that time. He had everything that a man could ever want as far as physical things. There was nothing that he lacked. But yet God began to deal with him as a young man, and he began, he, and he knew, he knew God had, God had shown him that these are your people, and he went out and he saw, he saw what was happening to his people, and it angered him, and he said, "I've got to do something here." Isn't that kind of how we are in America today? Kind of feel like Moses every now and then. I need to take matters in my own hands and fix this problem. Let me tell you something. It's not God's way of dealing with things. God's way is not for us to take up, take take matters in our own hands and try to try to take our country back. And it wasn't for Moses to go about it in the flesh and go out and try to kill Egyptians in order to to, to help his people. And the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter two verse fifteen. Now when Mo, when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. <coughs> Ended up 40 years he wound up on the backside of the desert. 40 years his life was seemingly nothing but a waste. And all that God had prepared him for, for 40 years he wandered out there. 
leading, leading herds of, of animals around the desert until one day, if you look there in verse chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt. And when Moses... And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off the shoes from off thy feet for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the afflictions, affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians." to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. You say, well, what, what can I find in this story? Again, you had Moses trying to do the good thing, but he's doing it the wrong way. He was, trying to, he was trying to emancipate his people back then, but he tried to do it in his strength. There's, there's good people, there's good Christian people who are trying their best to do right, but they're doing it in their strength, and they're doing it their way instead of waiting upon the Lord to show them the right way to go about things. Too many times we get full of zeal and we don't wait on God. We don't seek His will out. So we go and we try to do it our way and it ends up in disaster and we end up discouraged. I think sometimes that's why people quit on God. They try to do it and they try to they come up with ideas of things that they want to do and, and then when they fail they say, well, I don't know why God wouldn't help me. Well, it wasn't God leading you. Amen? You need to make sure God's in what you're doing. You need to have, have some confirmation from God. You say, where do I get confirmation from God at? The Bible. Amen? You never make a major life decision without confirmation from God's Word. Moses tried to do it, and Moses ended up wasting 40 years of his life walking around the backside of the desert before God was ready to use him. He had to learn to, to trust God and follow God's leading. You see what? God didn't leave him there, did he? God didn't leave him there. You see, when God spoke to him, he didn't say, no, God, I'm going to do it my way. I'm still going to do things my way. No, he humbled himself before God. It's the very same thing that happened to Jonah in the whale's belly. Jonah humbled himself before God. Moses humbled himself before God. Thirdly, we find another man. Judges chapter chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. <coughs> Turn over with me. <coughs> Judges chapter 16. Joshua judges Ruth. Judges chapter 16, we find the story of Samson. You know, Samson, Samson was born to be a judge over Israel. Samuel was anointed by God to be a judge over Israel. Samuel's parents were told he was never to cut his hair. He was never to uh, partake of, of wine or anything pertaining to grapes or wine. He was to be kept pure for the Lord. 
And if you know the story of Samson when he when he was grown, he see the nation of Israel was in captivity by the Philistines at that time, and God's people were really not to mix with the heathen tribes, but yet Samson he saw a woman down yonder that he wanted of the Philistines, and he went down to he went he sent to to, to get her, and, and and lo and behold, what had happened? Her daddy had given her to his friend. Samson got mad. So he took foxes and he tied their tails together and he put he put little firebrands in the midst between them and sent them out in their cornfields and burned their cornfields down. And then later on he he fell he fell for this floozy named Delilah. And the Philistines hated him because he was a judge. Of Israel, uh, over Israel, they hated him because of the power he wielded, and they wanted to destroy him. And you know the story. They wanted to know the source of his strength. They wanted to know how to destroy him because, I mean, he got so mad he took the jawbone of a donkey and ended up killing a thousand men with it. And was so thirsty when he got done, he didn't have no strength and cried out to God, and God clave a hole in the jawbone of the ass, and he got, he got a good swallow of water out of it. Amen. God took care of him. But you know what? When Something happened to Samson. Samson just got a little too big for his britches. Samson decided that rather than wait and see what God wanted him to have, Samson decided, you know what, I want what I want, and I'm going to get what I want to get. And so what did he do? He went and he he got with Delilah. And you know the story. The Philistines had gotten to, gotten to Delilah and said, listen, you need to find out what the source of his strength is. And I can't remember them all, but one of them was green, uh, green uh, vines that he was to be bound with, and and he told he told her that he said you buy me them green them green vines that's that'll stop me right there. And she said Philistines are upon thee, Samson. And he woke up and he snapped them green things off his arms. She said, Why are you doing me that way? Why won't, why are you telling me stories? You know that wasn't the source of your strength. And he said, Well, you tie me with new ropes that never tied anything before. And so. She, he he was bad about taking naps there anyway. But anyway, he took a nap and she tied him up with those new ropes and and she said the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he woke up and snapped them things off of him like it wasn't nothing. And she just got tired of it. And after 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 a while, she said, "You don't really love me. If you really love me, you tell me." He said, "Well, if you braid my hair up, put it all up, I guess like cornrows or something in a weave." He said, "That'll that'll do it." And so she braided his hair while he was asleep. The Philistines are upon thee, Samson. He's playing with fire, you see. Here's a man knows he, he had to Brother Thomas, he had to have known that he was in the wrong. He had to have known he was being naughty. He had to have known he was tempting God. He had to have known, but yet he wanted to do things his way. He was playing and flirting with fire, you see. He was flirting with disaster because he thought he could get away with it because he thought he was invincible. Let me tell you something. There ain't a Christian on this earth that's invincible. There ain't a Christian on this earth. You test God and tempt God enough. God's going to, hey, God's going to pull a rug out from under you when you least expect it. Well, she braided his hair and she said, the Philistines are upon me. And he stood up. He had no problem whatsoever. And then finally she cried. And she said, you know, you just don't love me, son. If you love me, you tell me what's wrong. What, what's the source of your strength? You tell me. I, I want to know you don't really love me if you want to share everything with me. So he said, fine. You know, if you, give me, if, if you cut my hair, that's the source of my strength. And sure enough, he must, she must have got him knocked out. Sound sleep good because... She called for somebody to come in and shave his head. And he woke up. And he stood up and he thought, oh, I'm fine. Then he realized he wasn't. God said, don't ever cut his hair. And yet he did. And now he has no strength of his own. The Bible says there in, in Judges 16, 21, but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes they took, they took something and they, they gouged him into his eyeballs and they burst his eyeballs and put his eyes out where he couldn't see and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. I want you to think about that. He's in there in the prison with a, with a big old piece of wood in front of him that's connected to a big grinding stone and he's 
walking in circles all day, pushing that grindstone. And they're dropping corn off into that thing, and he's just grinding and grinding and grinding, making cornmeal for them all day long. <clears throat> but you see these arrogant Philistines, they forgot something. They didn't send a barber in to check on him regularly. <laughs> Amen? They got cocky, and they thought, oh, we got him now. Well, his hair began to grow, the Bible says. How be it the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. And then the lords of the Philistine gathered together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. Y'all remember Dagon? That's the fish god. By the way, if you ever notice the, the you know, as old joke, does a pope wear a funny hat? Well, he does. And it's, it's shaped like a fish's mouth. If you've ever noticed the top of it, it's open. It's, it's modeled after Dagon, the fish god. I don't know if you knew that or not, but that's the same kind of hat that the, that the priests of Dagon wore. And they said that they, they came to offer great sacrifice to Dagon their God and to rejoice. For they said, Our God hath delivered Samson our enemy into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country which slew many of us. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson that he may make us sport. We want to laugh at him is what it was. They want to make fun of him. And they called for Samson out of the prison house. And he made and he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth. There were two main two great main uh pillars there in the house that supported the entire place where he and about three thousand Philistines were. He said, he said, put me, let me fill these pillars that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women and all the lords of the Philistines that were there. And, and there were upon the roof about 3,000 men. Oh, there was at least on the roof about 3,000. I don't know how many were below. <coughs> while, and that beheld while Samson made sport. That word's made sport there. That just means they, while they jeered at him, while they mocked him, while they, while they made a, a spectacle out of him. And Samson, <clears throat> called unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me. I pray thee and strengthen me, I pray thee only this once. O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two, miller po uh, two middle posts upon which the house stood and upon which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. You say, how did God give him a second chance? Well, let me say to you this. He didn't have a second chance to live and give God glory. He had ruined it so bad that God only gave him a chance to give him glory in his death. Folks, he still got a second chance. He still got a second chance. By, he, he, he absolutely couldn't take that they were worshiping these false gods and that they were mocking God. And he said, Lord, just one more time. Just one more time, give me strength. Just one more time. What had happened? The great and powerful Samson had been reduced to nothing. And it was when he realized that he was nothing without God that he realized that he needed God more than he'd ever needed him before. Let me tell you something. We 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 ourselves get to thinking we're too we, we get to thinking a little too much of ourselves sometimes. When we get to thinking a little too much of ourselves, we forget who God is in our life. And when we get to thinking a little too much of ourselves and we forget who God is in our life, that's when God takes his hand back and lets us go through and suffer troubles. God allows us, our enemies, to overtake us sometimes in order to make us realize we must rely on Him constantly. There is never a time when we can turn our, our backs on Him. There's never a time when we're to take the credit for what God has done in our life. And it was only when Samson was absolutely humbled to the lowest that Samson realized he needed God the most. And even though it was in the hour of his death, he gave God the glory. He gave God the glory, and he also destroyed the enemies of God. 
<laughs> you know, I'm, I'm gonna tell you something. I I think about I think about people that I've known in my life that it wasn't until their death that they gave God glory. I've seen people who 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 live right up and uh, who who live who live for themselves right up until the time that they knew they were gonna die, and they they and they finally gave God glory in death. My dad's one of them. I, I, I my dad didn't live for God at all, but nearing his death, he. He he yearned to do something to please God. He yearned to do something to give God glory. I I remember conversation after conversation of him sitting and telling me, "Oh, if God would just heal me this, what what a testimony I could have! Oh, if God would give me glory, I mean, if God would give me healing, what a glory I could give to Him." He used to tell me things like that. It wasn't until he died, and I was able to preach his funeral and tell others what he had told me and share with others the change that had happened in him that he was able to give glory to God and something good was able to come in his life. I want to tell you something. God gave God will give some a second chance on a deathbed. I want to I want to share just a couple more with you. Number 4. Let's look at John chapter 21. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. So what are you trying to say? I'm saying it's never too late to start over. John chapter 21. It's never too late to start over. We find Peter in John chapter 21. What had Peter done? Peter decided he was done with the preaching business. Peter had told them all, all the disciples. He said, he said in Greek, he said, Hupego, which means I... He said, I go a fishing. I'm going back to the fishing boats. I was in the fishing boat when Jesus found me, and now Jesus is hey, Jesus has died. Now Jesus, I'm going back to the fishing boat. I'm I, I'm done. I'm done. Why? He denied the Lord. Peter had denied the Lord. Peter had given up. Peter had quit. He'd thrown it all away. I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen to men of God who've thrown it all away and walked away from their calling. John chapter 21, verse 15 through 17. The Bible says, so when they had dined, well, what had happened? They'd been a fishing. They'd been out there, and, and, and Jesus had shown up on the shore, and, and they called to him, and, and John said, it's the Lord. And Peter is out there in the middle of the ocean, naked, getting in the nets together. And when he heard it was the Lord, he threw his clothes around him, and he, they swam up to where Jesus was, and Jesus had cooked them some fish on the fire. The Bible says that when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. And he saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Love is not words. Love is not words. There's a lot of people today, just because some some Catholic saint did something a long time ago, they feel like they've got to be special with their I love you's today. I'm, first of all, I'm not Catholic, and I love my wife every day. Okay, I told her that this morning. I don't know how well, well that was received. But anyway, I told her, I said, I love you no more today than I did yesterday, and I love you just as much tomorrow and every day. I'm spacing it out over the year instead of doing it all in one day. Amen? Listen, just because somebody else said I got to don't mean I got to. Words are empty. It's It's actions. Amen? You can tell God you love him all day long, but what do your actions say? Peter, at one time, his actions showed God, hey, I love you, I love you, and, I, and he was with him, and he, he would have done anything for him. But now he's gotten discouraged, and he's walked away, and he's denied the Lord three times, stood right there and said, I don't know who he is. I don't know him. And finally, he got mad and started cussing and, and carrying on and said, I don't know him. 
Why do you think the Lord asked him three times? Because he denied him three times. The Lord came to set things right. Can I tell you something? God doesn't halfway fix things. God's not, God's not in the business of halfway fixing things. If God comes and deals with you, God wants it all fixed. God loves us. Amen? If we're his child, he loves us. If we're his child, he wants that relationship restored. God, we're, we're his people. We're the sheep of his pasture. God wants to fellowship with us. We're created for his good pleasure. So God wants, God wants that fellowship with you and I. God wants us near him. God wants us uh, just as a sheep would follow a shepherd and expect to be fed and expect to be led and expect to be protected and expect to be comforted. God, God wants us to follow him like that. Not to say, I'm done, I'm walking off and I'm through. I don't want to do this anymore. Peter was humbled. Peter was humbled by the Lord three times. Respond. It broke Peter's heart. Peter came to the realization that love wasn't just words. Love's deeds. He said, feed my sheep. Get back out there and preach the word of God. Get back out there and turn sinners to me. I'm going to tell you something. He submitted himself once he was humbled. Samson submitted himself once he was humbled. Moses submitted himself, submitted himself once he was humbled. Let me tell you somebody else that did. The prodigal son did too. Luke chapter 15, verse 15 through 20. We know the story. He said, Father, give me what belongs to me. Give me half of all you're worth. I'm going to go on about my way. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to set out and I'm going to leave your household and I'm going to go find my own way. I'm ready to do it. Give me my give me my stuff. Give me what's coming to me. You know what happened. He went far off into a far country. He went to a big city and he found a bunch of fast friends who helped him spend his money. I mean, he was good time Charlie there for a while. He had everything he wanted. He had all the friends. He had all the girlfriends. He probably had all the booze and everything else to just have a great big old time in the flesh until it all ran out. Then he had no friends. Because them kind of friends, that's, that's the way they are. They just, they just fast friends until your stuff's gone. They're not friends at all. See, he had, he had all that he could have ever wanted back home with his father. He had all the love. He had all the, the, the companionship. He had all that. But he wasn't satisfied. He wanted to go find his own version of it. He wanted to go find something different than had been provided for him. And that's what's wrong with a lot of people. We're not willing to accept what God has for us. We think we know something better than God. We think we can find something better than God. And so we leave God's best for second best. So he went off down there and he spent it all and he had no money left. Verse 15 says, <clears throat> And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. <clears throat> he sold himself as a slave. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. The dirtiest job anybody could ever give to a Hebrew. The vilest thing could ever be asked to do. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. I think he was down there chewing on their food, hoping that somebody would walk by and see him out there and feel sorry for him and say, hey, don't eat that. Hey, I've got some food for you. But nobody felt sorry for him. You know what? You know why I think that happened? Because God was breaking him down. God was breaking his spirit. You know, God's a second chance God, but God will break you before he mends you. And when he came to himself, when he came to himself, I'm telling you, I've, I've preached this over and over again, but I can't get past that. He came to himself. He didn't blame his older brother anymore. Oh, my older brother, he's always been daddy's favorite. He's always been the best one. I guarantee he told all his buddies while they was drinking and partying, you know, my brother, he thinks he's all that. My daddy just thinks he's the best thing, and he never did favor me, but he loves my older brother. See, he quit, he quit blaming him. He quit blaming his daddy. 
He quit blaming everybody. Quit blaming everybody back at home. He quit blaming everybody, and he finally figured out it was that one guy that he looked at in the mirror. That's the fella. He came to himself. I made a mistake. I took the wrong path. I made a bad choice. It was me. I'm to blame. I turned my back on all that was right. And he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. You know, my daddy wasn't a bad guy. Hey, listen, I'm going to tell you something. Once, once a person's walked out of God's will, they, it, when they hit bottom, they realize just how good they had it. When, when God humbles you, you realize just how good you had it at his table. You can start over. You can start over. He said, I will arise and I'll go to my father. And I'll say unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. And I'm no worthy, more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. For when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. And he had compassion. And he ran and he fell on his neck. And he kissed him. Folks, that's a picture of, of us and God. That's a picture of us and God. And how many times have you failed? How many times have I failed? How many times have we have we been so stupid that we've we've walked away from what God was trying to show us or what God was trying to teach us? Some hard lesson He was teaching us to learn. Listen, there are hard lessons of life that we have to learn. There, there, there's, there's there's all these lessons. We have to depend on God. We can't trust ourselves. We can't do it our way and expect to prosper. Folks, we're not smarter than God. We can't outsmart Him. We can't outrun Him. We can't do it our way and expect it to work. God's way is always right. When God calls us to do something, if God calls us and sends us to do something, bless God, we can't back up on it and stop. God's way is perfect. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. You and I don't know God's ways. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. And what did the Father do? I can tell you this. If the Son had come up the road the way He left, there wouldn't have been the same reunion. But no, He'd been humbled. He'd been broken. He'd been at the point to where He realized He had nothing. And he needed God. Isn't it wonderful that when you get to that bottom, when you can't go no lower, when you can't lift yourself, isn't it good to know that God's still there? When you slide down that rope, it gets slippery. The further you go, the more slippery it gets. And you hit the knot at the bottom and you go over the knot and all you got left is the frayed ends. That's where I found myself in 1994. I'm sorry, 1996. That's where I found myself, 1996. I was hanging on to the frayed ends, and there was nothing left but God. And it was in that moment that I realized that He was everything I needed, that my way had been wrong. I'm telling you folks, I understand this story because I've lived it. I've lived it hard, and I know exactly that God will not forsake you. Even though you have forsaken Him, He will never forsake you. And if we'll simply come to ourselves and say, I have messed up. God, I've done it wrong. I've took a million wrong turns to get me to where I am right now. But Lord, you followed me the whole way and you're there. You won't leave me. What a God we serve. A God that say, turn around, just turn around, just turn around. I heard a song the other day on the radio. And it said, I can't remember all the words to it. But the, the, the gist of it was, just turn around. He's right there. What you're looking for, just turn around. That's all you need to do. He said, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. That was his estimation. That wasn't the father's estimation. You see, we get down at the bottom. We feel sorry for ourselves. I'm worthless. I'm worth nothing. I can't do anything. I'm used up. There's no more good in me. That was his estimation of himself. But I'm going to tell you something. That wasn't the father's estimation. What did he do? He didn't put him out there in the slave house. No, he put good shoes on his feet. He put a robe on him. He put a ring on his finger. He, pay, he prepared a barbecue supper for him. He wasn't worthless. 
I'll tell you something, and, and, and no matter what you've done, no matter how far you fall, you're not worthless either. Because you know what? You've been washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you're a child of God, there's no worthless in you. We simply have got to start over. Stop where we're going. Stop what we're doing and turn around and let God have us. Father saw him. He had compassion. He ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I'm going to tell you something. God wants to do the same thing with me and you if we simply turn to him. Listen, how, how can a sinning Christian make a new start? How can we start over if we've blown it? We've messed up time and time again. It's simple. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins... Isn't that where we started at? Covering your sins won't prosper. If we confess our sins, Lord, I have messed up. I have sinned against Thee. I have sinned against heaven and before Thee. Oh, Lord God. Or like a Moses who came to the realization that it had to be done God's way. Or like a Jonah who came to the very bottom and said, Lord, Salvation's of the Lord. You're the only one who can save me. Or like a Samson who realized it wasn't his strength after all, it was God's. Folks, we got to realize we can't do a thing without God. We can't, we can't, listen, I can't, I can't be a husband without God. I can't be a father without God. I can't, I can't be a pastor without him. I can't, I can't do anything without him. You can't either. Well, all of us were helpless without God. And we need him more than we need to breathe. We need his help. We need his direction. We need his strength. We need his power. We need his wisdom. I know Brother Miller said, you know, that, that verse he quoted, if my people which are called by my name. He said, you know, that... That's about a nation. Let me tell you, it's about people too. Because he says, my people. Oh, I'm a person. But you're called by my name. Well, I'm a, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. Shall humble themselves. That's the key to it right there. It's humbling yourself and saying, I can't make it without you, God. And pray. Not just sit and feel sorry and say, Lord, oh, I'm miserable. I, I, I can't do it without God. No, call out to him. You're never so far gone that God won't listen. If God will hear Jonah out of the bottom of the whale's belly, the bottom of the sea, God will hear you. Amen? Shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. God, I need you. Please come and my help. Please come and where I'm at. Lord, I've gone as far as I can go. And turn from their wicked ways. It's listen, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh, that's what it means. Turn from your wicked ways. God says, Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. It doesn't mean God's going to change America. But you know what? God can change my little corner of America. He can change your little corner of America. God can, God can come to the rescue in your life. And you know what? I don't know how long you got left. I don't know how much time you got left to give Him glory, but I'm going to tell you this. God wants to get some glory out of mine in your life. We got right now, we live right now and today, and what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with the remainder of our life? What are you going to do with the remainder of your life? Are you going to live it for you? Or are we going to sacrifice it for Christ? And let Him get glory out of our life. You can start over, you understand? You can start over. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. I want mercy. I need mercy. I need God to show up in my life and give me a season of refreshing, folks. How about you? Do you have needs this morning? I'm going to tell you something. He, he's got all you need. Come to Him. Bring it to Him. Go to Him in prayer. Call out to Him. Say, Lord, I've I, I got some things in my life that, Lord, I know you're not happy with them. Father, I want to forsake them and I want to confess them to you, Lord, and I want you to give me victory over them. Lord, I want you to come to my rescue and, and do something with this life. Lord, I don't want to be mediocre for the rest of my life. I don't want to just skate by. I want to do something great, but, Lord, I want to do it because you want me to, and I want to do it the way you want me to, and I want to do it in your strength. I want to give you glory. I want my life to be an example. I want my life to be a to be a to be a, a a big sign of God is real. God is able. God loves 
God loves folks. He wants them to be saved. He sent his only begotten son into this world to die for their sins. Jesus Christ is able to change the worst of us. He did something with me. I'm going to tell you something. If he can do something with me, he can do something with anybody. You can start over. No matter where you're at. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, I thank you. And I thank you for new beginnings. I thank you, Lord, that we can start over fresh. Lord, I'm thankful that you don't you don't throw the clay away, Lord. You'll remake us. I'm so thankful this this morning, Lord, that you rem you've remade me, and Lord, I'm thankful that you're still working on me, Lord. I'm thankful that, Lord, it, it's it's not over, Lord. We've still got ways to go. And Lord God, I pray that you show me if there be anything in me that's displeasing to you, Lord, that I can confess and forsake. Lord, I want to I want to yield myself to you this morning. And I want you to fill me with your power and I want you to use me. I want the remainder of my days to be a Lord to be a testimony to your your mercy and your grace. Father, I pray for these that are in the congregation this morning, Lord, if there be somebody here this morning who say, I, I, I need that too. Lord, I want the remainder of my days to bring glory to you. And I don't want to do it myself. I don't want to wind up, Lord, broken like 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 so many of these people in the Bible were. Lord, I, I, I want to I want to I want to be broken before you this morning, Lord, that I might not have to be broken. Lord, please, I pray, Father, that you bring us to that point before we before we end up in a real mess. Oh God, please, please do something with our lives. Please use us for your glory, Father. I just pray this morning you bless the one who's listening. Father, I pray, Lord, that you speak to their hearts this morning. Bless us now. We love you and we need you in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot of people that think that you know God would never use me. Just look at all the things I've done in my life. Look at all the ways I've messed up. I've gone too far for God to get anything out of my life. Well, that's that's hogwash. That's a lie straight out of the pit of hell. If God were done with you, you'd be in a cemetery somewhere. You understand? If your time was up, God God would have already God would have already been done. 
But God's not done. You know what that means and what that tells me? There's still some things for me and you to do. And if we still got some things to do, we need all God's power we can have. We need all His wisdom and direction we can have. So we need Him like we've never ever known we need Him. Let's go to Him. Let's stay with Him. Let's keep keep taking our, our, our needs to Him. Let's keep going to Him with our burdens. Let's, let's, let's keep asking Him, Lord, uh, Lord, please show me Your will. Please show me Your way. Please, Lord, when, when, whenever there's an opportunity in front of me to be used of You, Lord, please make it plain to me. Don't, don't let me miss it. Don't let me miss somebody that needs You. Make it, bring it to my memory. Bring it to my thoughts that I might be able to act upon it. Don't, don't, don't deny him when he calls on you to do something for him. Let's, let's stay close to him. Let's don't wander. Amen. We need him more than ever. Amen. Praise God. I hope, I hope God blessed you, showed you something this morning, encouraged you a little bit. And I pray that, that